In this lesson, we're going to move away from looking at the theological influences of natural law theory, looking at people like Augustine and Aquinas within the sort of early Middle Ages and the, and the high Middle Ages. And we're going to start to talk about how natural law exists in today's jurisprudential conversations, whether or not natural law still does exist and what the modern theories of natural law actually are. So, so far, our study of the natural law tradition within the sort of broader philosophy of law has gone from looking at the historical developments, beginning with the ancient world of Plato and Aristotle, and then talking about how Plato and Aristotle were influential on the religious influences, people like Augustine and Aquinas. This lesson, we're going to talk briefly about the impact of these classical theories uh, before turning to look at an introduction at more modern natural law theories. And we will then um, spend the final two lessons on natural law looking at those two theories in more detail. So we have spent a lot of time and a, and a few weeks exploring classical natural law. We've been talking about the way in which it is elucidated through the ancient thinkers of Plato and Aristotle at least influenced with 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 uh, with a limited amount of hinting, essentially, uh, with Plato um, not placing too much emphasis on the importance of law, and Aristotle placing a little bit more emphasis on the importance of the law, specifically within the the idea of the nature of the human condition. But it's only really where we see the uh, early church fathers and the sort of mid high Middle Ages uh, with Saint Augustine and Saint Thomas Aquinas that we start to see the the true elucidation of what we would understand natural law theory to be to this day. It's for that reason that many people when studying natural law probably don't think that much about Plato and Aristotle, even though in reality um, those were the two influential uh, Greek philosophers that really um, had such an impact on the way in which um, Catholic doctrine and religious doctrine in the medieval period um, actually operated and things like scholasticism as a movement and the sort of the rediscovery discovery of the classical world. We've seen these theories situate themselves within the broader question of ontology, talking about the ontology of law more generally, i.e. what is law itself? What actually is it to call something law? What does that actually mean? When we talk about law, how, why, do we, why do we describe some things as law and some things as not law? Uh, and one of the issues that was had by these classical natural law theories is whether or not it is sufficient in proving more substantive analyses behind some of the critical issues within jurisprudence. So the question that was asked and the question that seems to be uh, most pertinent for those of the, of the classical natural law theorists is what makes something law? With the, with the religious um, uh, influences, they argued that it was um, adherent to some higher authority, some eternal rule, such as the, the, the law that is created by God, or, uh, or, or some kind of adherence to uh, a, a higher objective morality, i.e. biblical morality, or some kind of natural law um, that is uh, more of a moral theory rather than just a theory of law. But these are questions of ontology. These are questions of uh, they're essentially asking um, what are the things that we what if we have a set of all things that are called law, what does it require? What does it require for something to be a part of that set, essentially? So the more substantive issues like the process of lawmaking, the administration of law, the concepts of justice aren't necessarily um, as uh, influential in these classical theories of natural law. And so as a result of which, we think about the impact of these classical theories, these are theories which are impactful on the basis of their ontological influences over law. But the concept of procedural uh, lawmaking and the concept of administration of law and the concept of, of justice are things that we're going to have to think about when we look to the modern theories of natural law. Now, the thing about modern natural law is that for the longest of time, um, it was um, relatively uh, niche as a as a movement, uh, owing to the growing importance and the growing popularity of legal positivism. And so there are various social, cultural and philosophical reasons why the interrelation between law and morality became less and less popular during the sort of Enlightenment period and even in today's understanding of jurisprudence to an extent. However, certain things that takes place 
that takes place in the early 20th century um, actually brings back this question of law and morality and things like, for example, the atrocities that took place in Eastern Europe in the 1920s and the 1930s with the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany gave, uh, uh, gave this question of law and morality and the reconciliation between the two um, more and more importance. So more and more people were asking questions as to how is it the case that law has been able to um, allow for things like war and genocide to take place in such a in such a, a, a flagrant and 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 brutal way. So the development of law in this case surely should bring with it reference to morality, owing to the uh, fact that under legal systems that existed in the Western world, at least within Germany, um, things like genocide was able to take place and dictatorship was able to um, grow and fester. Now. While legal positivism doesn't necessarily avoid or refuse to talk about the conceptualizations of law in relation to the concept of morality, within the traditional legal definition at least, it does relegate issues pertaining to morality to the periphery of the core concepts within legal jurisprudence. So, whereas natural law takes uh, moral philosophy and makes it a central thesis within its general theories of jurisprudence legal positivism takes moral philosophy and has sort of leaves it to the peripheries and as a result of this the resur resurgence of more modern forms of natural law begin to increase in popularity owing to the clear moral questions that had to be asked at the end of the second world war and uh, and continue to be asked even to this day so with all of this context given, let's think about what the two modern natural law theories that we're going to focus on in the next two lessons are. We're going to talk about procedural natural law, a theory which was developed by um, philosopher Lonel Fuller. And then we will also talk about a, um, a, a theory of natural rights, which is a, a, a development theory um, which is developed by Finnis. So Fuller and Finnis are arguably the two uh, most prominent modern natural law theorists. And we'll talk about what procedural natural law is in the next lesson. And then we'll talk about what the theory of natural rights entails in the lesson after.